These are in listen-only mode. Hello, and welcome to the Education Connections webinar, Effective Strategies for Integrating English Learner Students' Funds of Knowledge into Classroom Practices. We are delighted to be joined by Eric Johnson from Washington State University Tri-Cities. My name is Lindsay Massoud, and I will be moderating tonight's session. We'd like to extend a warm welcome to everyone who's been able to join us today for our first Education Connections webinar of the 2016-17 school year and our 18th webinar in our ongoing series of live events. Thank you so much for joining us tonight or this afternoon, depending on where you are, um, both to those of you who are already a member of the Education Connections community as well as those of you who may be new to Education Connections. We're so glad all of you could be here. We'll begin tonight's session with a brief introduction, including an overview of Education Connections. Then we'll hear from uh, Dr. Eric Johnson. Following his presentation, we'll have some time reserved for questions and comments from participants. We'll be monitoring those as they come in, so we encourage you to send along any thoughts or questions that come to mind using the questions box in the GoToWebinar window. During tonight's session, we'll also be posting some polling questions related to your background and today's topic. When results are in, we'll post them for you to view. We also invite you to chat further about today's topic by joining us on Twitter. You can use the hashtag EdConnects, E-D-C-O-N-X, to participate in the conversation with Education Connection staff and your fellow educators. So for those of you who may be new to Education Connections, we wanted to briefly introduce you to the community and resources available. Education Connections is an initiative of the Center for Applied Linguistics in collaboration with the University of Oregon. It's hosted on the University of Oregon's Obaverse platform. Education Connections is a free online community providing access to a wide range of resources and bringing educators together to collaborate around implementing high quality standards-based instruction with all students and especially English learner students. There are many different ways to participate. You can share ideas and ask questions in the discussion forums, find resources to use in your classroom, participate in live events such as this one, and read Tuesday's tips and Friday's fun facts that are shared in the forums every week. Anyone is welcome to join, so we invite you to sign up today if you're not already a member. As a reminder, the Education Connections team will post a video archive of the webinar, a PDF of the PowerPoint, and links to resources related to today's webinar. To access these, log on to Education Connections and click on the Live Events tab. On your screen now, you'll see a few polling questions um, come in regarding your background, and we'll post these results as you respond. Okay, so it looks like we have 40% EL, ELL, ESOL, or bilingual teachers, and then about 20% instructional coaches, teacher educators, and 20% ELL, ESOL, bilingual coordinators or administrators. Um, not so many general education teachers here with us tonight, so it looks like mostly people who are working um, directly with English learners um, and with their teachers, and then a mysterious 20% of others. So. Um, if you want to post who you are in the questions box, feel free to do so, or um, we'll, we'll remain a mystery. Um, all right, so now we'll ask um, what grade levels you currently work with. All right, so it looks like majority are working with elementary students, um, and then a few in middle school, just a couple in high school, and some working across pre-K-12, um, and a handful also at college or university. So it looks like a crowd that's trending toward elementary, but, but definitely represented across the spectrum. 
Right, and the last question that we wanted to ask is, what region of the country are you in? Um, so, Northeast, Midwest, Southwest, or are you outside of the U.S.? All right, so we have a good representation from the West, um, and then scattered across Northeast, South, and a few Midwesterners as well. Um, no one from internationally tonight, um, but yeah, great. So we've got, we've got the country covered. Um, it's great to know a little bit more about everyone who's here. Um, welcome again. We're so glad that you are taking the time um, to be with us, and I will now turn it over to um, Dr. Johnson to share with you um, about Funds of Knowledge. All right, thanks, Lindsay. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody and really appreciate you attending tonight's webinar. Uh, we wanted to make it as interactive as possible, so I encourage you to um, go ahead and submit your questions in the, uh, the question um, box and um, periodically throughout the presentation, Lindsay and her team will be um, interjecting those types of questions uh, for, or comments for clarification too. Uh, regardless, at the end we'll also have some space to uh, mull over some of the issues or questions that, um, that arise. Um, so a little bit about myself, I'm a, a professor of bilingual and ESL education at uh, uh, Washington State University Tri-Cities in Eastern Washington, which I'll uh, talk a little bit more about in a minute, um, and I have lived in Arizona for 11 years um, before I moved to Washington um, and uh, did my degrees in anthropology and uh, looked at the effects of negative or oppressive language policies, um, anti-bilingual education policies on um, immigrant communities and teachers and uh, school districts, and um, now I'm working with similar um, issues, except the, the programs here in Washington are much more supportive. Um, but regardless, I you know, have a big emphasis on making, uh, helping teachers connect to their students and their students' lives as a way to not only um, enhance academic progress, but um, strengthen those um, community relations between the school and uh, the families and, and Households. So today's webinar would be, it's going to be rather fast, a little over a half an hour probably, but um, I'm going to chunk it into three um, main themes. So we'll first look at some policy um, connections uh, for supporting ELL students. Um, then we'll get into funds of knowledge and classroom applications. And then we'll uh, walk through family engagement strategies for working with. Um, the parents and families of, of ELL students to help uh, your students academically. Um, now, a lot of the examples that I use uh, are based on work with um, immigrant communities and immigrants from uh, Latin American backgrounds, um, but you know the the overall premise of what I'm going to discuss can be applied to um, any student. Um, and a student from any language or cultural background, um, even English-speaking students. But in, especially in Washington, there is um, a very alarming trend where you have um, the vast majority of ELL students in the state are um, Spanish-speaking students. Um, in Washington, it's around um, 65 to 70%. Um, and of those, uh, you can see that uh, these are national trends, but of those ELL students, many are foreign born and first generation, and trends tell us that those um, students are the ones that uh, face the most challenges and um, have the trend of dropping out in high school um, the most. So that's why the examples that I give are based on um, usually Spanish-speaking or Latino communities. Uh, those are the communities that I personally work with. But um, I'm going to, I try to give examples from other students and um, other parts of the state so that you also get a feel for how it works with, uh, with, with students from different cultural backgrounds. 
Um, this is just a, a census map of um, Spanish-speaking um, households, and um, you know, it's sometimes it's easy to justify working with Spanish-speaking um, families and communities due to the prevalence. Um, you can see up here in Washington, we we have a, a really um, rich linguistic diversity um, as compared to maybe other places that uh, that are just now experiencing growth in their language diversity. But regardless, um, whether historically you've had a lot of ELL students or um, you're one of the new um, you know, emerging communities with a lot of ELL students, these particular strategies apply across the board. So uh, leaving, when I left Arizona, um, Arizona was, as I said before, really oppressive and it outlawed bilingual education, a mandated structured English um, immersion. Uh, af after one year, students were to be mainstreamed. Um, but then when I came to Washington, their state level policy was very much the opposite. Um, and up front, the state, uh, the, it's called the Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction, is, is very progressive about supporting language and culture as assets. Right? Um, and and this is a fantastic place to start, but my question is like how? And so they promote that um, this this type of approach. Um, the state's really supportive of um, many different types of programs, bilingual, dual language. Um, but when it boils down to a classroom context, like what does that actually look like for teachers and students? And that's um, that's where this presentation is grounded. Um, again, another policy connection is with the uh, federal policy on family engagement, um, where Title III funds um, are to be, at least some of them, are to be used to uh, conduct outreach to parents of ELL students and to support those home school um, relationships and connections. But once again, my, my question is, like, how? What does that mean to um, you know, a classroom teacher or a building administrator? It's great to be mandated in policy, but when it plays out in, in, on the local level, sometimes that can be very difficult um, for educators to, um, to actually put into motion. Um, so one way that our, the state has been supportive of this type of work um, has been to collaborate uh, with me on putting together this, a website that I'm going to return to periodically in this presentation. Um, and this website is, we call it the Funds of Knowledge and Home Visits Toolkit um, that you can visit. It has multiple different resources on, um, this one's all about doing home visits. Um, and once again, I'll come back to it, like how do you do it? What are the resources involved? Um, I've got you know, some PDFs of my articles up there. Uh, the Funds of Knowledge um, concept, but also how it applies in, in the classroom. And so I really encourage you to go to this website and um, look at the resources that they have been supporting. Um, testimonials, policy support. Um, if you work for a state agency and want more information on this, uh, the contact information is down there. So anyways, I'll be returning to this as we, as we move through the presentation. But that's, so that's one answer to the question, how? Right? So the state has been really um, supportive of this work in getting the word out for specific strategies. Um, this particular webinar is going to go over some of those strategies that we've been promoting. Um, so on a, on, a, on a base level, um, it's, most teachers are very aware that the, uh, the most effective way to uh, get students to learn new information or academic information is to map that onto previously experienced information um, or tap into their background knowledge. And so um, essentially the funds of knowledge concept is, is based on that. So how do you take their um, outside of school experiences as well as inside of school experiences in those um, particular learning schema? And how do you map that into a classroom setting where um, they're able to make those um, effective scaffolds for learning new information? And that's where this concept of the funds of knowledge, which I'm sure um, most of you have heard before, um, that's where this concept really comes in. Um, and the, what, I, what I've seen is that you, the majority of teachers that I work with or administrators know this concept, 
Um, but when it gets, again, down to how it actually plays out in a classroom um, context, uh, that's where they lose some steam. Um, and so on this slide, you can see I have um, you know, the, the way that it's been described by um, the Belez and Ibanez and Greenberg original piece and, and also Norma Gonzalez and, and her, um, you know, her co-authors in their, in their influential work. But in, in, from a general perspective, it, the funds of knowledge is a way of, um, of knowing. It's all of the historical um, experiences and um, skills that they've acquired, um, that students have acquired to navigate their everyday interactions. Um, it also has to do with what are the what broader social influences have impacted them in terms of how they understand their lives, um, whether that's uh, you know legal policies or historical policies or social racism or or, or whatever. Um, and once you can start to identify those particular skills and worldviews, then you can really make an impact on the way students. Um, you know, understand and engage with material in a classroom. Um, now, in Washington, for our language development standards, we uh, were part of a consortium that uses the English language proficiency standards. And the guide, the first page, the second guiding principle is based on using the students' funds of knowledge. And so, everybody who um, who works with ELL students here in Washington. Uh, has these standards, and this is on the first page. But once again, it gives a you know a very eloquent description of funds of knowledge, but then it just doesn't tell them how that actually looks. So what I try to do in in workshops and with my students, um, I, I teach both undergraduate and graduate, uh, is train them on first how you know, what is what what does the concept of funds of knowledge mean? But how do you see? How do you identify students' funds of knowledge? Um, and the way that, that I go about this is to have them identify, you know, what are, the, what are the practices that your students are involved in outside of school first? You know, um, you know what, are, what are their families involved in, um, either whether it's jobs or hobbies or um, just daily practices, and then try to term or try to label those particular practices um, in terms of um, specific categories. And if you can see community practices in terms of particular categories, then you can start to develop a sense of, okay, how does that apply or how could I apply that in, um, you know, we use the Common Core State Standards, but how can I apply that for our curriculum that also supports um, the standard based education that, um, that a lot of the teachers are, um, you know, really required to adhere to. Um, so the first step before we get into individual students' um, funds of knowledge is I have, I have my, my students or teachers in the workshops identify community contexts and what types of funds of knowledge they can glean from those particular contexts. So in Eastern Washington, um, there it's highly agricultural, um, and one of my one of my students was from a, a city, Ellensburg, which is in central Washington. But hay farming is a very prominent um, part of the economy there, and a lot of families are connected to um, the these hay fields and and the cultivation of hay. So then I say, okay, well that's a prominent aspect in your community. What types of um, skills or what types of funds of knowledge do you see um, that students are involved in or their families are involved in? Well, um, they start labeling things general categories like agriculture, right, or science, math, biology, engineering. So what does that mean? Like the mechanical engineering. Well, they the kids might help their parents or their, their, their parents might be a, a mechanic on one of these large tractors. Um, but at home on the weekends, the kids are helping the parent um, you know, work on cars. And, and who knows, maybe they, they buy and sell cars. And so if you, if you can figure that kind of stuff out, then you can work that into um, different science lessons or math lessons or language arts lessons. And what you're doing is taking the, the outside schema that the kids have for just a normal weekend um, or stuff they've learned from their parents and integrating it into a classroom. Um, again, this, 
this isn't difficult, it's just making that next step to actually do it. Um, in a more urban setting, uh, a group of students uh, from Western Washington actually, uh, they identified this transit um, center, this metro um, context with, with buses um, as very prominent in, in their community for the immigrant and uh, minority students um, who a lot didn't have vehicles. And so they then unfolded that particular context into different categories that they could use in their classroom. Uh, that's geography or um, how to you know, ask for directions, um, different types of literacy that they went and got maps from this place and um, looked at you know, decoding maps and then or whatever, math and pollution. But they were able then to work those into their particular lessons um, and the students were super excited about drawing on their background knowledge of getting from these different points and um, actually the teachers reported that they learned um, different ways to save time by taking different buses and so on and so forth. But again, you're motivating the students, you're drawing on what they know and then scaffolding it to the academic context. context. Um, now, the, um, the, in, in my opinion, the ultimate way to uh, understand the, your ELL students' backgrounds is to engage with them and their families um, outside of a, a school context. And those, um, I, I refer to them as home visits, but it doesn't necessarily need to be in a home. It, it can be at other contexts. But when you work with families and students outside of a school context, you're um, decentering that that locus of power that the school often represents, um, and you're you're putting yourself on uh, level ground to gain a better understanding of the parents and the students' lives outside of school, right? And then you can see more of the individual practices and and cultural patterns that the students have. Um, now, in one example. There is a student who um, uh, that I worked with when I intensively when I got when I first arrived to Washington. She was in seventh grade, um, and I just maintained contact with her over the years. But her dad called me up, and um, we went over to her house, and he had a question, you know, about something. But when he got there, he was asking me uh, about building a greenhouse. He thought that the government gave subsidies for building greenhouses, anyways. And I didn't know the word in Spanish, so that was interesting to, for me to have to figure that out. But he started describing this plant that he was he was going to grow, but he needed a greenhouse. And uh, I, I speak Spanish pretty well, but I wasn't aware of the, this word. It was um, uh, maracuya, passion fruit. And um, so he had his daughter, who was an ELL student, arrived at 12 years old, um, struggled in school mightily. And so she, when he was trying to explain it, she got out their computer and he was telling her what to look up and she was, she was then explaining it to me um, when we figured out the fruit, then they got into the actual botany of how to grow it. Now, you, you can't, that, that's a tropical fruit. And so I kept asking, well, how are you going to grow that here? We're, we're a desert community, but in the winter it gets very cold. Um, snows gets freezing, you know, and so he and actually it was in February and he was already growing them in his house, so he, that's why he needed the the greenhouse. He had figured out a way to get seeds from people in Mexico and any, so but she's she was basically interpreting all of this and telling me the botany of the plant and how to, how it grows and and I'm sitting there just baffled how she's you know giving me such detailed information about all of this and yet you know she can't pass. Her, her science classes, or she's struggling in, um, uh, you know, in 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 math or whatever. When she's doing real life applications of those subjects right in front of me. Um, now, just the that summer, I went by the guy's house, and he'd actually he built his own greenhouse, and those are the plants. So he, even though I thought it wouldn't work. You know, he he did it, and um, you know, he still got it growing strong. So he has a heater in there. Uh, some other stuff that he does, but the the kids. The point is that they're involved with this very um, nuanced information and knowledge that most teachers wouldn't even be aware of. Um, now, how do you connect that to a classroom? That's that's the essential question. 
Um, now, when I when I work with teachers on engaging parents and doing home visits, um, uh, a lot of times I get I get pushback, and um, you you have students who will say that's not my job, or teachers say you know parents should come to us. Um, in in addition to learning more about the funds of knowledge, you have all of these other beneficial um, results that, that come out of doing these types of engagement activities. And this is an email I received from, um, ironically, a graduate student who, uh, in one of my classes, they have to do a home visit, um, and she took the zero just because she said she wouldn't do it. But then the next fall, when she wasn't in my class, she did one. Um, she felt really bad after everybody said how amazing of an experience they had. And you can see that she started to understand it wasn't just about going to the student's home and and you know put making the teacher uncomfortable. It has these effects that the students become more comfortable and they see you know the teacher as a resource and they they become more of a leader and and so on and so forth. And so it's that's usually how I approach home visits is to say one is the funds of knowledge that you'll you'll glean from doing these visits, and two, it's the relationship that you build with the student and their families um, as a byproduct of doing these types of activities. So what I've done is broken um, these, the home visit process into three phases, um, and down here is an article. I'm gonna, I'll go through this um, rather quickly, but down here is an article that uh, unpacks this in a little bit more detail and gives the teacher's perspective um, of doing this type of um, work. It's also on the website that I was discussing. If you go to home visits and go down to the bottom, um, you can get the PDF of the of the actual article uh, in case you want more background on that. Okay, so I've found that chopping this into three phases really helps teachers wrap their mind around how to go about it. Now, the uh, the first phase is what you do before, right? And I always encourage you to contact, work with your administrators um, or instructional coaches or whoever whoever your allies are in um, really supporting ELL students. Let them know what you're doing. Um, and, you know, work with the counselors, see if there's any um, anything, that any supplies or any resources that you can uh, gather before you you conduct a, a visit. Um, you know anything that you can that you can learn about the family prior really helps. But you want to just basically set it up so that you're going in as um, a learner. Now a lot of uh, a lot of folks have problems setting up the visit, not because it's difficult to set up, but because that's their excuse for not doing it. And so I prefer just informally talking to parents, but another successful way that my students have had is to send a letter home um, and just say that they want to come meet the student and or meet the family and um, let the family meet them. So the way that my students in the past have done this has been to, I say, write two nice things or positive things about the student and then just say you'd love to meet the family. Uh, then leave a little area down below for them to write back. Now, the next thing is my students say, well, I don't know how to write in whatever language. So this, the website um, actually has, in the home visits link, this link, send letters home, and it has, I think, 40 different languages represented where um, you can you know, go in, and open up a template. That has the basic letter format that I do, where you can then type in stuff in your English or in English, and then it has this translated. This part that says I to support families, I do in the in the home language. And so this way, the the students can read the part that you write, you know, uh, to their parents. Um, and then the parents have specific information in their in their own language. Um, so, anyways, I thought that was a that would be really helpful for uh, for folks who were having problems translating letters. Um, let's see. Um, and this was so that's just the template that I that we used um, and the state um, translated. Okay. 
So the next part is, okay, once we get there, what do we do? Um, my emphasis is to go in, again, as a learner. Uh, the longer you can be there without talking about school, the better. Um, the more you can just have a conversation about uh, your, your family, wherever they're from, um, and, and not make it a parent-teacher conference, the better. As the, the one thing I do tell teachers is, or whoever, they, the one thing you do have in common is school. So you can always talk about school. But then again, it should never be negative. Like you're for, even if there are behavior issues with the kid, the first visit um, and first contact with the parents, don't say anything negative. And a lot of times if the kid does have behavior issues and you go to the house, don't talk about it, <laughs> the, the behavior issues clear up um, as a result. Uh, anyways, so there are a ton of different topics you know that you can work through with with parents. And while you're discussing these topics, you have to keep your ear tuned for learning about them. And this is where the funds of knowledge weaves back in. You're observing the surroundings. You're talking to, to them about their lives and and taking note. Um, I, you know, I still do a lot of home visits as a college professor um, because I like to explain different how the levels of education differ in the United States versus wherever um, whatever country they might have gone to school in. Um, things like grading scales or scholarships. Uh, you'd be surprised. Parents are very uh, open and appreciative for this type of um, information. But I've had students take games over or um, pictures of, of different places they've traveled. Um, the last one is student work. And like I said, you always have that, but um, try to hold on as long as you can, you can before making it into a uh, discussion about school per se. Um, one of our uh, educational service um, districts here came up with a home home visit funds of knowledge kit that had a bunch of um, toys and stories and games that are common in Mexico the teachers could go over and have parents teach them so it's a teacher teacher type of a um, approach which is a really neat way to to build relationships with the parents so after the visit is when the mechanics of, of bringing all of that together happen. And um, now a lot of it is going to be based on your perceptions, what you experienced, recording them, um, either officially or um, just remembering them. Um, I prefer writing them down. Um, but then again, spreading the, uh, spreading the word. Talk to your colleagues. Um, the, more, the more teachers who conduct these types of visits, the more used to it um, parents become, but then the, the tighter the relationship becomes between the school and the home. Um, now, the, the other thing that I like to do is work through lists of concerns. Now, I've done many workshops and many classes with this, and so I've heard the list is long. Um, but usually concerns, um, lit, as small as they can be, will, it, per, they will cause teachers to avoid these types of visits. And so when you think of a concern, think of not only the concern, but okay, now how do you get beyond it? Okay. And a lot of it is going to be based on our own biases, um, uh, anxieties. So that's the prime. If you read the article, that's the primary, um, you know, issue that keeps teachers from conducting these types of engagement activities is their own anxieties. They just manifest in terms of whatever language and and um, food and stuff like that. Um, now, mechanically, when we start bridging the funds of knowledge to the classroom. I use this, what I'm calling a funds of knowledge um, matrix, and I have my students do their, their visits, um, and then whatever practices they observe or hear about, they note them in this particular matrix. So it's whatever you see going on at home, they write in this part. And then they brainstorm ways to apply it in their classroom. Again, not very sophisticated, but very powerful. Okay. Now, the well, the next, I have an example here on, of what it looks like when, um, when students go through and actually do this activity. Um, but on the, uh, on the website, once again, if you go to the funds of knowledge component, here's a more detailed version of how that looks. Right? And you can also download um, just a, okay, buddy, you can download the template if that helps you get going.
right? Now you can do this for individual students. You can do it for, say you do three or four visits in a, um, a semester. Uh, you can put all of them, just put all the student stuff into one chart and you have that at your disposal because you never know what's going to come up or what um, brainstorm idea is going to apply in two or three months. Anyway, so that, uh, that is a good resource that uh, teachers have reported using quite often. So I wanted to give you an example of what, uh, what one of them looked like. So I just clipped a cell um, out of one of my students' uh, assignments after doing the visit. Uh, and he noted that sports is a very prominent one, uh, whether the kids like sports or they watch it. But um, my student here is noting how his, dad, his student, Mario, um, Mario's dad, Jose, is very athletic. He plays in uh, a soccer league. He was a, uh, a boxer. He met um, Roberto Mano de Piedra Duran. And so his idea was to apply soccer in the classroom and start a soccer club. And okay, so that, that's great. Now, there, I also require my students to actually implement one of the ideas that they have. And what he decided, he met with the student, he said, hey, I want to use something from the visit in the classroom. And what he decided on doing was doing um, the boxing theme. And so this is, that's Muhammad Ali. Um, but he got a, he had the dad text him a picture of the dad boxing. And so he created this lesson, showed the guy, the dad boxing, the picture of the boxing, and had all of these um, really cool math problems based on um, a boxing ring. Um, anyway, so the, the student who had been struggling and disengaged or whatever was so excited and was leading the activities and was just very proud and was very motivated um, to continue in other activities that weren't specifically based on, on that context. Um, I've had a, another one of my students went and did a visit and got caught up in an impromptu tortilla making um, lesson that the students taught her. And so she then took that and um, integrated tortilla making into her history and social studies class and looked at um, Mesoamerica and the history of tortillas and so on, and the ingredients and applied it in some really interesting ways. Um, once again, having the students help her develop um, that theme and lesson for, and lead the, the lesson for her students. This is one from um, <clears throat> a Burmese family where the students went, did a home visit, and uh, found that their, their students' families were making kimchi, um, and basically they were burying it in the backyard, and then they would make it and sell it at a flea market. And, but then the kimchi, she learned that the parents were, um, the health department said you couldn't, they couldn't sell it anymore because it wasn't regulated and wasn't um, checked in terms of the, the pH or whatever. So they took it back to the class and designed a lesson on testing kimchi for adequate um, pH levels. The kids then um, went home, and they had multiple Burmese families in this class, went home and taught their parents how to do it. And the parents then were able to get the proper um, license to make it and sell it because they were testing it in front of the proper authorities. And so I thought that had a really cool uh, social justice slant to it also, where you're not only teaching the kids about pH and the math and, and science involved, but then they're working with their community on how to really get back into the, uh, the economy um, using their home strategies. Um, their flea markets are very, swap meets are very common to see younger kids working and so um, we, a lot of my students work with their, their K-12 students on the jobs that they do, whether it's record keeping or money or so on and so forth. So that's always a really positive one. Um, I also encourage my students to look at language patterns that are in their particular community. Um, we have a lot of uh, Spanglish in, in, the, in the area that's looked at as negative um, in the classroom. We, this is out of a bilingual classroom. And um, so I try to turn that on its head and, and uh, so have teachers record instances of code switching or Spanglish that they observe in their students' homes or in the community and use it for instructional purposes. Um, and this is just a superficial example, but it's, it it's actually it can be very significant where one, uh, one teacher had 
you know, students write out different phrases um, in Spanglish, and or you can use song lyrics or ads. But then they code switched it into um, academic Spanish and academic English, and they 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 worked on really nuanced um, orthographic features and uh, made connections between English and Spanish. So once again, the, the kids' home language wasn't denigrated, um, or language community language patterns weren't seen as negative, they were seen as um, just different. And you can also say that in ways that are used in a classroom. So I thought that was very creative in and of itself. Um, now we also have, um, we just have a couple more minutes, but um, I have an example of a little bit more in-depth um, view of how this process takes place based on my wife, one of my, my wife's a fourth grade teacher. And she did, uh, she was having problems with a, a kid, behavior problems, and so we did um, a home visit with, with this student, named Caesar, and found out, you know, he'd been, it was in fourth grade, and he, he was on his third school um, because his parents kept moving him in the same district, but the teachers were treating him so poorly because of his behavior. Anyway, so they felt totally marginalized, so we did a home visit, found out you know, he's involved with animals and lived on a ranch, had a bug connection or a collection, sorry, raised animals. Um, even though he never would write anything, he he would create these drawings and write about them at home. He's very technical and his, uh, he had a big stereo system that he helped his dad put in and that's his room. He didn't paint that, but whatever. So he, and he had a big book collection. So it was a night and day in terms of what he uh, would do in a classroom. And uh, so we, my wife and I worked on designing a way to have him, to engage him more and had him design lessons based on his interests um, and then teach the students about his interests and actually ended up really in, amazing, more amazing than I could imagine. And he led this big lesson on automobiles and had students do research and he came up with graphic organizers and you're talking about a kid that had, was on his third school and wasn't doing anything, and it was um, you know middle of the year, so it really reengaged him. Um, we also did a science lesson, and um, it was so successful that his dad, who was up about to put a lawsuit on the district for mistreating his son, got so excited that his dad came in and reconnected with the school and helped teach a lesson with this kid. So that I mean that was just um, that was just a beautiful example of how this the potential of how this can play out. Um, now I went over that pretty quickly, but uh, there's an article where it's described in more depth. We actually had two uh, students for this um, particular study, and if you if you go to the Funds of Knowledge link at the bottom, you can find the PDF for, for that uh, article to look through more of the mechanical issues of doing the visit and creating the lessons. Um, Okay, so um, before we go into some questioning, um, some Q&A time, I just want to take a, a step back and look at some of how the topics we were discussing, meaning um, conducting home visits, uh, family or parent engagement strategies, um, you know, integrating funds of knowledge. You know, how does that impact all of the, the, the stakeholders involved here? And what you're going to see is that it's not only um, impacting student progress, but it's really making an impact on the, on the parents um, and giving them more of a secure connection uh, to the schools when often they feel intimidated. Um, it's creating that sense of trust in you as a, uh, not only a, an educator, but a broker, a cultural broker um, that uh, often works with parents on, on issues outside of school but they will see you as someone to trust. Um, obviously, the students it, um, have the unfolding effects uh, are amazing uh, in, in my experience. But then from a teaching perspective, it, it's a little bit more work up front, but you'll see things like classroom management start to um, become easier. You, you're going to see that the, the strength and relationships that you develop with students also affects other students because then they're aware of the time that you take to visit individual students. And, um, you know, uh, one of the points that teachers make is that they don't have time to visit um, all 30, or if they're in middle school, all or high school, all 150 students. That's not the point. The point is, you know, you you can you can visit one student, and the word gets out. Right? If you do one a month, that's more. <laughs> that's that's amazing. Um, 
I've had students visit all their students uh, before school starts even. So there is no you have to visit all. It just starts with one. Okay. Um, you can also learn about their their lives by being engaged with them outside of school in sporting events or at their job or whatever. I've seen many different manifestations of this. Um, okay, so uh, this is my email address. Um, if any of our questions don't uh, get addressed or any of your questions don't get addressed, feel free to email me. Also, I'd love to hear the cool stuff that um, teachers are doing um, that are applied to home visits and funds of knowledge so that I can share those with you know with my students and, and the community that I'm involved with. So please email me with any questions or um, further input um, to help me better understand your context. Okay. So Lindsay, I think we you wanted to spend about the last 15 minutes um, talking through some of the questions. Yes, thank you so much. This has been incredibly interesting and um, we've loved listening. I hope everybody has as well. Um, we have a bunch of questions that have come in. Um, so we'll read some of these off to you um, and see what, what other advice you have for us here. Um, so one person asks, is there research that shows that home visits improve academic learning or funds of knowledge within content increasing learning? Let me see if I understand the question. So is there research that demonstrates academic progress within specific content areas? Is that the um, question? She's asking if, like, what research has there been that shows the effectiveness of home visits. So you, I think this question probably is getting that. You've shared um, stories where it seems to really engage students, um, but are there specific research studies that have shown um, impact oh, for I, learning from as a result of implementing home visits? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. For so the the home visit article that um, I showed. Um, for that article, I did an extensive review of the literature on home visits, and um, in that article, I, obviously, it's very brief, but I, it's the pri the primary body of literature on home visits is with um, like young, pr like preschool kids, um, but it's based on teachers going in to teach parents things, um, and not so much on the backside of it on how that affects students, uh, and actually, the the biggest body of literature is on like the health profession, like getting nurses and and health care professionals to do home visits. So that's why I decided to carve out that this particular niche and say, well, let's look at um, how home visits impact students academically. Now to do that, the, the article that I wrote is based on the teachers doing it. And so the impact on the teachers the second article that um, that I showed based on that case study with that last student, that's the one where I have a lot of resources in the, uh, the literature section on previous studies that have looked at funds of knowledge and have looked at um, home visits. But, it, you know, and funds of knowledge is a, a widespread concept, but you re rarely see them wed like that. So I guess to answer the question more specifically is that there isn't a lot out there basically because it's hard to quantify direct correlation between conducting a home visit and test scores. But what you do see is um, literature out there that shows the the qualitative nature of how this stuff unfolds. And so my my background being in anthropology, um, my background as an ethnographer is to look at how that plays out on the ground level or the micro level context qualitatively. Um, in the article I showed that we wrote on that, that particular case study, should, I mean it's, it takes, the, the kids are way more engaged um, and even the student who was doing well, we did two students, she, she was way more engaged and she's continued to be, both students um, over the past three years have continued to be um, engaged in school and doing well. So yes, 
I would recommend just downloading that article and, and looking at some of the, the other you know, literature cited, but um, it's really hard because it's hard to connect a test score to that type of thing. Sure. Great. Well, thank you for that response, and um, we'll make sure to check out the article as well. Um, so somebody is also asking, what advice, you touched on this a little bit toward the end, but what advice do you have for teachers who teach 110 plus kids in regards to home visits, um, and also if the neighborhoods are not safe for teachers? So you had touched on this a little bit. You said, you know, just start with one. How do you start? Um, how might you identify, um, you know, that first student to start, you know, to reach out to their family? Yeah, so, I mean, there are many different ways that this this plays out. Um, it's, and there is no formula for you walk up to a student and start the conversation about X. You, what I would do is, if you have 150 students, if you have a student who's struggling, you know, you, you really want to work with that student in, in multiple different ways. Um, but one of those ways you can say, yeah, I'd love to, you know, come over and meet your parents. And, or I'd love to, um, love to have you show me how you, if, they, if they're an artist or they build stuff or start that conversation with them. And I've never had a student say no. Um, now, you, what, I think it's easier to look at the other side of the coin. So if you have a student with um, behavior issues and you don't get along with that student, then that's not going to be the first student that you, you want to engage um, or the, just to ask if you can go see their parents because the parents have already had a history of negative interactions with the school and everybody's going to think that it's, it's negative. So if you do one or two visits and you celebrate those visits, um, you know, I in the, in the article I say have a home visit wall where you show pictures and the word spreads that you, you go and meet with families and the students then know that you're not a threat. Um, I've had tremendous success working with students who have behavior issues doing home visits and that's why I recommend when you do that you don't say anything negative about the student. Um, one thing that we all have in common is that we're all teachers trying to um, you know, promote academic progress and ultimately you know, get our students through you know, a college education or um, whatever post-secondary opportunities. And so that's one way you can go about it is you, you tell your student, hey, I want to come over and, and tell your parents you know, how to get you to college. And it's just a great platform for, for starting a conversation um, without being negative. So it also varies according to grade level. Like the little, the little kids are, that's, a, that's real easy. Middle school kids, um, my, I really like middle school um, myself personally, but middle school kids will see this in a completely different way. They don't see you as a buddy buddy like a, a, a younger one might, they, they understand the depth of what you're doing. So in high school also. Um, and so that's, you, you don't visit all, you visit one. A lot of times the students live in neighborhoods where there are other students. And so when you're doing a visit, you, and a visit can just be to the front door, but you say, oh yeah, who else lives around here? Take me over there. And it, or just when you're walking through the neighborhood, you'll see kids. The second part of that question had to do with um, safety. Um, you know, I personally, I I think that issue is one that is built up in our minds to the point where um, you know teachers create a sense of, of feeling unsafe that's not necessary. So, um, like I, I hold personally, I hold my classes in um, mobile home communities and places like that so that that fear of low socioeconomic status areas, um, you know, they, they, it, we can erode that fear by making students realize that it's, it's not this pit of danger. Um, but that said, if, I mean, if there's a, if there's a particular family that, that you know that has had, um, you know, 
violence or whatever, if it's a specific incident, then that's not going to be the one you want to go to first. Um, but after doing multiple visits, like I, I've been in, I've been in all sorts of situations and never felt unsafe. Um, and so I, you know, I, it's just a matter of you know, facing our own biases, and um, I think it really means a lot to students when you go over to their um, house or in their neighborhood and they they know that it doesn't bother you, that you really care about them that much. Great, thank you so much for that thoughtful response. Um, we have somebody asking, should administrators also go at home visits? Oh, absolutely. And you know what? what's interesting is um, here in in the districts, uh, you know, where I'm engaged, some of the the most vocal supporters of home visits are administrators. And actually, the home visit article that that I have that I showed is in an educational leadership journal, and I did that on purpose because for if you can engage administrators in, in this type of approach, it, leadership trickles down, right? And so I absolutely think that administrators should go. Re, read the article. Administrators should go as educators and not, you know, not as that power dynamic, but I think that speaks volumes. Um, and then the administrator can offer to go with any of the teachers who might um, be still feeling anxiety about conducting a visit. So yeah, 100% um, supportive of administrators doing these visits. Great, thank you so much. Um, so we just have a couple of minutes. Um, somebody asked, do you have suggestions for equitably acknowledging funds of knowledge in very linguistically and culturally diverse classrooms? Um, so a big question for two minutes. <laughs> Um, but do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, it, this is where teachers have to feel out their particular context. Um, some students, at, at, they they might you know come from um, uh, I don't know like a, a a caring community from Burma who, who they don't want others to know um, you know that that their particular language background because it might identify them as you know. A marginalized group at home and whatever the dynamic is you, you don't want to make students contribute um, whatever language um, resource that you the teachers want you want to work with them so that they they want to contribute and I would I mean if you have their districts with you know 200 different languages and that that's hard but if you you know start with students one at a time and you know do the strategies, do, go take pictures of the community signage, and I, there is no formula. It's feel it out, represent um, as many groups as, as you can who are engaged and willing to without putting anybody on the spot. Um, and I see, and I don't know where this the questions are, how many questions, but on my screen it says it, there's a question about strategies for um, newcomer immigrant students who have suffered trauma. And that's kind of what I was getting at. Uh, we have a, a refugee settlement um, organization here called World Relief, and uh, we I actually helped them. We 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 we've done a a really powerful refugee simulation training for one of the districts um, to give teachers an, an idea of what that process is like. But that's a that's a situation where you really want to be sensitive um, to those students' backgrounds and what they've experienced um, instead of going over there and, and mandating that, you know, I don't, looking like you're mandating that they give you information. So, yeah, I mean, it's about building a relationship with the student first and then reaching out to the parents and, and testing the water to make sure that they feel secure, um, you know, and, and that happens in, in baby steps as well as just contacting and saying you want to go over. So um, just feel out the context. It's like going on a first date, right? You, there is no formula for what to say and do and <laughs> how to go about it. It's be sensitive, but keep moving forward. Great. Thank you so much. Um, 
I'm, it's sad to say we're out of time. Um, this has been really fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Johnson, for sharing Absolutely. your expertise and um, some of the resources that you have. Um, we also we po posted a link to your website and your email address in the chat box. If people are looking for those, you can um, copy those down before we sign off. Um, and you can, of course, also access the archive on Education Connections as well. If you have questions, feel, feel free to reach out to us or to Dr. Johnson. Um, and once again, um, if you're looking for the archive, you can go to edconnect.obaverse.net and find it there. Um, we look forward to continuing to collaborate with you all and look forward to um, continuing to hash out some of these really difficult and important issues. Um, thank you so much for taking the time. We know it's a really busy time of year with school startup, so we appreciate each of you joining us. And thank you again, Dr. Johnson, um, for this wonderful presentation and sharing your, uh, your experiences with us. Um, hope you Absolutely. all have a wonderful evening. Yes, <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.